things are good. So my name is Willie Anderson. Um, the, the slide's a little bit out of date. If you I am the incoming CEO for the DevOps Collective. Uh, we are a 501c3 no, uh, nonprofit organization that runs this conference primarily. Uh, I'm also a cloud solutions architect for a company called Cortex Services out of Michigan. Uh, no, the Canada hoodie wasn't a mistake. I do live there, uh, but I am American, so it's a little bit confusing. Uh, I'm also a cloud and data center management MVP with primary focus on PowerShell and Azure. So I do a lot of Azure automation. I write a crap ton of Azure ARM templates. So that's why we're having the talk today. And then if you want to find me out on the Twitters or social media, pretty much anywhere, just Gamer Living Will is my handle for pretty much everything. You can even find me on Xbox. So the Azure vision. Um, you know, since they moved to the, the Azure RM model off of the classic model, everything has really been geared towards star as code, uh, regardless if it's configuration, infrastructure, even governance policy. You're starting to see a lot of the stuff uh, as far as like um, RBAC, you know, role-based access and controls, stuff like that. A lot of that stuff is designed to be automated uh, through templates. And it's not quite there as they're adding new technologies and you know, the, the templates kind of follow in short suit, but you know, they're, they're constantly iterating through that, so you're seeing a lot more of those things coming into play. So why templates? Well, they, they combine the benefits of underlying you know, uh, ARM with the adaptability and readability of JavaScript object notation. This makes things very simple. Has anybody ever tried you know, creating like an Azure VM purely through PowerShell? Um, to, to give you a little bit of a, a difference in the amount of code required when, I, I did a blog post a couple of years ago when Azure Classic was a big thing and you could actually deploy a VM with like five lines of code. Um, nowadays, I, I know that they've come out with some new commandlets that uh, make the process a little bit simpler, but up until recently, uh, the, with Azure RM, it required more than 70 because you had to define how every single object was configured. Um, the, this is, so the, the JSON templates actually made things a little bit simpler, but the language is a little bit kind of intimidating too. And that's, that's kind of what we're gonna be working through today. But it allows you to deploy topo uh, topologies and workloads consistently. You can make things item potent, so once you have a JSON template, you can stamp it out in basically any region uh, globally if you're doing it right, and it's going to look the exact same way across the board. Um, you, know, you manage all of your resources in an application together in resource groups. We're gonna be talking about some of the best practices around that. You can apply RBAC and then use tagging to, to streamline things such as bill billing uh, in asset management, which is highly important. One of the things that you need to do when you start working on Azure templates is to think item potently. So, you know, being able to go from that one to many model. And, you know, th this is very much that pets versus cattle mentality where, you know, the, when it comes to template design, you, you really want to be able to create a template in a way that not only is it easily, easy to rapidly deploy across multiple regions, but also be able to destroy that instance and rebuild it um, with greater ease than having to go through and following a bunch of manual steps to do so. Thinking imperatively is another uh, advantage to Azure templates. So, you know, ARM templates are designed to define the goal state of an application. How do you want it to look, regardless if it's configuring load balancers, virtual machines, uh, traffic managers, storage uh, configurations, and stuff like that. Applying DSC configurations. Um, you know, everything altogether is empirical. You know exactly what you're putting into the environment. You know exactly what the dependencies are, the order of operations. Everything has to be uh, very well outlined. So getting into some of the best practices when it comes to templates, one of the things that I bring up with a lot of people is choices versus decisions. 
Um, when you're talking about parameters and variables, these are the choices versus the decisions. Pr parameters are input thing, you know, things that your end user is going to be inputting. Um, and then the variables underneath are the decisions that you make based off of uh, those user inputs. This is very important. If you look at, uh, is anybody like built a VM in Azure and then downloaded the template? If you notice in there, it's got all of these things in the parameter fields like the computer name and the IP address and the user accounts, and blah, 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 blah. The more choices that you give your end user to make, uh, the more likely they are to, to screw something up. So one of the big goals that you have when you're creating these templates is to provide as few uh, decisions to your users as possible or choices to your users as possible, and then based off of those choices, make decisions for them. Computer naming conventions, what automation accounts to use, how many VMs to spin up uh, for dev, QA, and prod environments, things like this can all be made as decisions in the underlying template. Basically what I said. Um, one of the other things that is very much key is user accounts. So working, you know, having done a lot of work for Fortune 500 companies uh, where they were basically environments where they gave subscriptions out to their developers, you wouldn't believe the number of instantiations we saw where basically the admin account was admin and password was password. That's bad. So those are things that you want to be able to, to take away from, from your users and be able to make the right decisions. The Azure Key Vault does a really good job, but I'm a little bit more partial towards Azure Automation Account Creds, primarily because in Azure is, are you guys familiar with the two? I'll show you guys this a little bit later, but um, actually I could show you right now. But basically what it comes down to is uh, Azure Key Vault um, will, gives you the ability to unobfuscate the password. Not really something that I want to be able to hand over to my admins to use. Oh, hey, connection to the internet is a good thing. Okay, who's got the Wi-Fi access called Homer because that's awesome. Waiting to log in. Yes, connect to Wi Fi. Okay. So let me just drag this over here real quick. All right, so if I bounce into my automation account here, uh, do, 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 go. Oh, stop. I'm a little click happy this morning. I've had too much coffee, I guess. Oh, I think it's going off screen. Let me fix this real quick. Where'd my scroll bar go? There we go. I thought I had a key vault in here. Anyway, with the key fault, you can actually uh, unobfuscate the uh, password, whereas when you're using Azure Automation Account Credentials, those passwords always stay completely <coughs> hidden away. So even though I'm the id, uh, owner of this um, subscription, if I go and I look at a, a key, you know, I'll jump in here, and you'll see the password is obfuscated, and I have no way to be able to, to take that away. So 
kind of a big deal. Um, what it gives you is the ability to have like your SQL administrators or your app administrators, anybody that kind of uses a service account, you could give them the access to the automation account to be able to apply those credentials and then as an administrator, you can use the credential to deploy the environment without necessarily knowing what those credentials are. So it's a little bit more secure. Uh, so that's you know pretty important. Um, so moving along here, one of the uh, one of the big things that I get into is decision making with uh, complex variable constructs. Is anybody kind of playing around with this right now? Excellent. So who here is familiar with a hash table? Or actually, better yet, can, uh, configuration data in DSC? Okay. So uh, essentially what a complex variable is, um, because in an Azure template, uh, basic variables are just key value pairs, right? Essentially what you're doing with a complex variable is you're creating an object. Um, you're defining those objects based off of key naming. So you can see here, like uh, I've got my VM configuration. NP denotes non-production. Uh, PR denotes production. And then I have these tables underneath that define like what I want my web server to look like given a certain configuration. Now, the way that this is called, and I'll be showing you guys this in code, the way this is called is uh, you have a variable that references the uh, complex variable that you want to grab, and then the input parameter. And then when the JSON template runs, it looks at the input parameter, goes through this list and says, you know, for, for example, if I'm in a production environment, okay, I need to look at the PR table, and then I need to grab the object references for that. And then you can dot source this in your template. This allows you to, to do a lot of decision making on behalf of your user. Say maybe for your non-production environment, you only want like two web servers and a load balance configuration. But for your production environment, maybe you want four. Maybe you want bigger servers in the production than the, the smaller one, or vice versa. Um, so this allows you to actually make a lot of those decisions underneath. Clear as mud yet? Awesome. Um, one of the other best practices that you want to follow is keep naming simple, naming standard simple. I know that there's a lot of people out there that want to have, you know, some randomized, you know, string of characters or they're like, you know, A, B, C, this many zeros and then denote it with a one or something to make it completely, you know, unreadable. Um, or, you know, yeah, I've seen some weird and crazy stuff, but you want to keep it simple and standard across all of your resources. Uh, the, the reason why is because you want to be able to easily identify what resources are connected to what. So if you have a computer naming convention where it's maybe a couple letters to define what application it is, uh, you'll have like dev QA or prod in there so you know what, what environment level it is. You might have the region in there denoted by a couple of characters. So that way it's easy to identify what region you're looking at without having to look at the resource group and then maybe some numbers. But then you'll take that base naming and you'll apply it to like your network interface for that VM. So you have your computer name plus like NIF. Uh, you might have a load balancer and just call it LB. You'll have a public IP and just call it pub IP. Uh, but this allows you standard naming across the board. One of the other things that I tend to tell a lot of my customers is that you want to avoid uh, hyphens and special characters. Uh, the reason why is because now you're creating, uh, you know, VMs can take uh, hyphens, but what is it? I think storage groups can't. Yeah, storage groups can't. So now you're having to create different naming conventions for all of your different objects. You're adding complexity. And as we all know, complexity breeds catastrophe. Uh, you also have to be cognizant of naming limitations. So Windows VMs can't exceed more than 15 characters still, even though we live in a 64-bit era. Don't know why, but that's the way it is. Uh, storage accounts, on the other hand, can't exceed 24 characters. So you need to be cognizant of that when you're making these rules up. Uh, you also have to be aware of things that require globally unique naming. 
storage accounts, public IPs, web apps, stuff like that. Um, and you know, global naming is not just to your organization, it's global period. I remember the first time I went to create an Azure RM storage account and I thought it would be really you know, cool and nerdy and call it Vault 101. Nope, somebody already took that. Wasn't in my organization, it was somebody else globally, but apparently there's you know, other nerds that are faster than I am. Um, <laughs> template parameter file versus template object. Um, this is hugely important, guys. I, I see this all the time. Actually, if you go to the Azure Quick Start templates, you see it rather frequently, where a lot of people have parameters.json files that they put all of the, the parameter inputs. Number one, you're, you're using a static file, so you've already thrown item potency out the window. Number two, one of the most common mistakes that I see is that oftentimes there will be something in the parameters to pass credentials. So what do I see in those parameters.json files? Username, password. Great, thank you for putting it in a plain text file that anybody can read. Um, so in you know, adding additional layers of security on top of these parameter files, it, it's just a pain in the butt. You know, if you want, you, know, you might have to store it in a blob store, and then you have to deal with SAS tokens, and then you have to create the constructs in order to be able to generate those SAS tokens, and then you're managing them, and it's a complete pain. Whereas the other way that you can go is template parameter objects, which are fantastic. So if you're doing uh, deployments via PowerShell, you can actually do that in a parameter object and um, you know, deploy it on the fly. And I'll go ahead and uh, pull up my Visual Studio code here and show you how that looks. As soon as I clear all my customer stuff off the screen. Drag this over here. So, wow, this green stuff is really cool. Um, can you guys read that in the back, by the way? Okay, so uh, basically, what we're doing here is I'm setting up for an account deployment, kind of using that same template uh, that I was showing you in the screenshot. And you can see here that I have a parameter object that I'm generating. And the parameter object is actually doing a couple of things for me. It's grabbing the location uh, by getting the resource group that I'm deploying to. It's got the uh, environment, you know, that NPPR that we had defined for the complex variable constructs. And then I also have the automation account like registry key and URL, so that way I can go ahead and uh, assign this thing a node configuration and desired state config. And I can do this on the fly. So, you know, as, you know, maybe I have some of this automation code in my CI CD or whatever to do my deployments for me, then basically it can just go off and say, okay, I'm going over to West US, so we're gonna create a resource group there, grab the object, import that into the parameters, and then go ahead and do our deployments. Uh, and then also maybe have some automation to define what um, uh, automation account that I wanna hook up to if I'm doing maybe multi-geo automation accounts. So this allows me to, to go ahead and do this stuff on the fly instead of having to generate a bunch of static files that I have to, to go ahead and build. Once again, clear as mud. Excellent. Um, moving on. So this is a huge conversation, one of the, probably the most frequent uh, questions that I get asked on a regular basis is, what about nested templates or linked templates? Um, and this is kind of one of those things that I would love to have a conversation with you guys about. Uh, so, the, 
the, the basically Azure templates give you the ability to link to child templates. So maybe you'll have a standardized template for how you want a VM to look, or the network guys have a standardized template for how the network looks. I've never actually found, in my experience, a valid use case for those linking of templates. One of the one of the most common question or one of the most common statements I hear is, well, our network guys want to be able to define the, the template for creating a virtual network. They want it to look a certain way and have certain controls and et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada, yada. Which is great. I think that all of the organizations should definitely be involved in maybe creating the standards for how those templates are built, but not necessarily creating a template. And the reason why I posit this is because what if you're relying heavily on Azure templates to do your deployments and you're pulling these linked templates in? And then maybe uh, your network team or your storage team or somebody like storage decides, you know what, instead of V1 storage, we're gonna go to V2 storage. And they go ahead and update their template. Then any template that relies on that as a child or as a linked template is going to have to be tested and validated. Or if you're doing automated deployments, they may just all of a sudden blow up on you. Now, that you have all these things relying on these linked templates, anytime that wants to make a change, anyone wants to make a change, all of the subsequent uh, templates that it relies on have to be reviewed, and now you have a review panel that is going to be far, far worse than your change control board it could ever be. So I tend to say don't use linked templates. Uh, the, the, what I usually say is have your organization define the standards of how things should look and how they should be built, and then make sure that the uh, deployment teams are actually following those set standards. Is anybody here using child templates? Awesome, that's, that's what I like to see, no hands. So secrets and source, we kinda talked a little bit about this. Don't do this, um, instead, do this. This is where the automation account credentials come in very key to play. Um, because you know, basically when you're, when you're calling that into a template, it's pulling it as a PS credential. Uh, it's all handled at runtime. So if you're doing it through, actually ideally through an Azure runbook because that is done in that instance and as soon as the automation runbook is finished, that VM goes away, and then anything that could have potentially been captured in memory is gone. Um, but definitely don't leave it as part of the template file, uh, because any time that you have a static file anywhere, I don't care what kind of security, security you're laying down on it, anything can be hacked. API version is a variable. This is the one that drives me nuts. I, I will slam your laptop lid down on your fingers if I catch you doing this. Um, but it's also probably the most common thing that I see in the Azure Quick Start Gallery. Here's the problem. API versions, if you start looking through the schemas, are typically specific to the object for which it, it is written. So an API version for a storage account is not necessarily going to be the same as a VM or anything like that. Uh, I've actually grabbed quick start templates where the API version was hard coded as a single variable and passed to all the subsequent objects, and I go to deploy that template and it completely explodes on me because there's only one object in there that it actually goes for. Um, so quite you know, this is, this is the, the most aggravating mistake that I'll see. API versions, you don't necessarily need to update them for every single iteration that comes out. One of the things that I usually tell my customers is that if there is a, um, you know, like if you're, if you're doing an iterative code change, maybe you wanna do a deployment with the latest version of the APIs to make sure that it works with your application, uh, or maybe there's some features in the newer API that you wanna be able to leverage. But other than that, you're not going to be modifying or updating it that often. So, you know, just put it, you know, set it as part of the resource, leave it alone unless you want to update it. 
Another thing that I often see, especially in the Quick Start Gallery, and you're going to hear me picking on that a lot, is people using Concat uh, instead of Resource ID. Really, this deals more with behavior with templates. So essentially, what it comes down to is at runtime, when the Azure environment is compiling the JSON template for deployment, the way it behaves, especially when it comes to depends on, is that if you have another object referenced in your template in depends on as a concat, it expects that object to already exist. Whereas if you go by resource ID, it's going to look for that resource ID in the list of objects that you're defining going, okay, it's not created yet, but I know that you know, once it's created, I can start working on this. Whereas with Concat, it's going to throw a bunch of errors and say it doesn't exist, and then your template deployment is going to fail. So be very cognizant of where you need to use it when. Now, I will tell you that one area where this kind of starts to go off the rails is in the networking constructs, especially with like load balancers, where you're actually calling the resource ID and then concatenating it with other string information in order to be able to be able to, to reference the full string. I have no idea why they do that instead of just dot sourcing the property. Um, but you know that, that's one of the things that you have to look out for, and I'll, I'll be walking you through some of that stuff. Unnecessary dependencies. So, oh, my animations aren't working. There we go. Keep it clean and simple. Don't overcomplicate things. Um, basically, the, the way resource dependencies work is, you know, it's your order of operations, right? So, and I, I've seen a lot of templates where or people get frustrated because they start building resource dependencies and kind of start creating like these circular logic errors where you know, they go to the, deploy the template and they don't know why it's failing, but then you look at resource dependencies and they want to like create a VNet and the network interface is reliant on the, the VNet and they want to attach the, the public IP, so they make the public IP reliant on the network interface, but they're also making the public IP reliant on the VNet. Well, that's a nice big circle and it's not going to work. So try to keep it simple and clean. Uh, this does get a little bit muddied, especially when you're talking about VM deployments, um, because say maybe you might have to have an RODC in the environment. Uh, so you have to build the objects for that RODC, maybe apply the DSC configuration, but the way the, like the DSC extension works is it returns a successful when the extension is installed, not necessarily when the configuration is completed. So even, you know, so what I'll often see is people are stamping out the machines and then having, you know, having uh, the subsequent machines waiting on the creation of the RODC VM and then having their uh, subsequent DSC configurations wait on the RODC configuration. Well, then there's no domain controller there because that DSC configuration hasn't start, you know, started processing. So often what I do, oftentimes what I do is I don't have those VMs actually start creating until the DSC configuration or DSC extension installation for that RODC is complete. I'm actually going to be showing you some examples of how that works. But try to keep your dependencies to an absolute minimum and keep it as streamlined as possible because that's oftentimes where I see a lot of thing, uh, mistakes occur. So how many people have heard you know, uh, people online say, oh, don't create your templates from scratch, you know, go ahead and pull it from the quick start galleries and then just modify it as you need it, stuff like that. Show of hands? Yeah. Uh, really great if you're good at coding or if you're already familiar with JSON. Um, if you're like me, you weren't when you started. Um, and we're, we're all you know, admins and engineers and stuff here, right? We're, we're used to understanding the nuts and bolts of how something works. So I always say that basically um, use the quick start gallery kind of as a starting point. Uh, don't use the, the quick start gallery as production ready code, but most importantly, 
take the time and build the stuff on your own. Um, because you're not going to understand the behavior of these template resources until you start playing with it and experimenting with it. If you're relying on these quick start galleries, if they work right off the bat, which I want to say about 60% of the time they won't, um, you know, you, you're not really understanding the underlying constructs. And it's very, very important that you do. Because if something breaks sometime down the line, you need to be able to read into it, understand what the expected behavior is, and then be able to trace back why it's failing. Uh, also, like I said, the quick start te uh, templates tend to not follow best practices. They are almost never item potent. So if you look through the quick start gallery, you're going to see templates that are going to have 50 billion parameters. No, I don't want my user to make decisions. So, uh, you know, try to build them on your own. Try to make them as item potent as possible. Authoring best practices. I won't necessarily slam your laptop lid on your fingers for not following these, but you know, my eye might twitch a little bit if you don't. Uh, use camel case. So, and this is one thing: is PowerShell people. We're we're always taught to use you know capitalize the first letter, or if it's an abbreviation, make sure those three letters are capitalized. Not really the the kind of standardization for authoring templates uh, goes. It's you know the first word would be lowercase, the second one is cap capitalized. Th this is more just so you don't irk the programmers. Uh, don't specify locations. So templates can't be used to deploy resource groups. They're something that you use to deploy to a resource group. So a lot of these objects, unless you're reaching out to something that already exists, are going to be pulling into that resource group. You get more flexibility and more item potency if you use the resource group.location uh, object. Because now I'm not reliant on a hard-coded uh, resource group location, it's whatever de location I'm deploying to, it's going to automatically pull that location and then specify it in my objects. Tags. Um, number one, allow automation to create your tags on the fly. So you can use the, you know, you, you can do this a number of different ways. You can pass it in as parameter objects and then have your CI CD do the decision making for you. You can go ahead and build uh, tags on the fly uh, using automation. But most importantly, tag your resources. I can't tell you how many projects where they've paid me stupid amounts of money to go through and come up with some kind of automation to go back and tag resources because they didn't know what org to bill what objects to. So you want to start getting ahead of that right off the bat. Use outputs. So this is super, super important. Uh, you can actually, there's a construct called outputs that outputs certain data. So like if you have public IP addresses or you have like asset management and you need that computer name or those object names, you can actually leverage that in the object output and then be able to pass that to additional automation or to be able to register uh, that information wherever you need it to go. So IPAM or asset management or what have you. And I'll show you how those constructs work. So before I get into demo time, anybody have any questions? I know it's Tuesday morning, and we had a lot of drinking last night, but come on. Somebody's got to have a question. There we go. When you go out and you go out in an environment and you're doing simply, do you put all of your stuff in one template and call the different objects, or do you break it out for each object and then call those templates for each object? So that gets into the whole child templates discussion, and I don't like to do it. Um, primarily because the purpose of a template is to define what that specific environment is to look like. So you're painting that picture, right? And that picture is going to change between instance to instance. So, like, you know, I might have one application that needs to be painted a certain way. Another organization or another group is going to have their application painted a different way. Um, and then you have to manage what happens if one of those child templates changes. And that creates a lot of unnecessarily complica unnecessary complication. Like I said, it, it will make your uh, change management uh, you know, process look tame. Because anytime you want to make a change to that child template, you have to go back and revalidate everything that it's dependent on. 
So I, I say, you know, it, use it to kind of like a DSC configuration where, you know, you, you're painting the picture of how you want a box to look. The ARM template is how you want that specific application environment to look. So um, in that way, you know, if they decide to update the standards, then they can go deal with the app owners to update their stuff, but they don't, it's not incumbent on that specific organization to go and harangue everybody. Or they can just say, hey, going forward, this is what the standard is, leave your current environments alone. So it's a lot easier to manage from, from that perspective. Anybody else? Uh, the template that I have will create its own domain, so uh, it's kind of one of those things that I'm a little bit proud of. Uh, it creates its own domain controller and stuff, but if you're talking to like uh, connecting to Azure uh, AA, uh, what is it, Azure Active Directory Domain Services, uh, I don't have a template for that yet. Um, that primarily because it just went in like GA not too long ago and I haven't had any time to play with it. Uh, just in general, just running it on server to run it. Yeah, and I'll show you how I do that. Any other questions? Go for it. It depends. And I'll show you what the, the examples look like in my template. Uh, actually, let me go ahead and start queuing that up. I have you guys until 10, right? 10.45, awesome, even better. I don't have to talk fast to make your eyes bleed. I will be making example code available to you guys, by the way. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do a live demonstration for you. However, I'm not going to guarantee that it's going to work. Okay, and here's, here's an example where I'm actually grabbing a uh, admin password and user from my key vault. Um, basically, I'm gonna just kind of walk through what we're doing here. So you can see here, I'm uh, you know, giving a base name to my environment. So this base name is actually going to be part of the decision making going into uh, my naming conventions and whatnot. Uh, but the user doesn't actually see it because the base name goes into the resource group and then the automation knows to pull that base name off of the resource group name and start generating stuff. Uh, you can see here I'm grabbing my automation account. Uh, I've specified my automation account name and resource group. And then basically the, uh, where is it? You can see the automation account name here. So I'm going to be getting that, uh, actually, nope, nope, that's old code. Where did it go? Resource group, deployment. Oh, okay, I guess in this case I am using uh, the key vault. So we'll be seeing how that pulls. Now, interestingly enough, and this is gonna be getting into like the automate or the Azure DSC stuff, the Azure DSC stuff actually grabs from the credential store. Uh, so that, that's something that I can show you a little bit later if we have time, but uh, I just wanted to show you how I'm pulling all this information. Then it's all passed in as a hash table, and then it's going to be given over to the new Azure RM resource group deployment uh, as a template parameter object. So I'm gonna go ahead and kick this off real quick. Do, 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 do. Hopefully this doesn't explode.
going to probably ask me for a key. No? Okay. Habit. Um, it, it just it's habitual from you know way back in the day. So I'm gonna go ahead and trigger this real quick. But you'll see here uh, I have verbose tagged onto these. Uh, part of the reason is because if you don't use verbose. Um, you don't actually get a return until anything's completed, and even then you get a null output. So, like if I do my test right now, because I took out verbose, oh, if I had taken out verbose, you just get a null output. Um, at least with this, I, I get some kind of a return, nice, warm, fuzzy feeling that it actually did the check, especially since I'm using VS Code, which sometimes gets a little bit flaky on the PowerShell output. Um, and then when I pass it over to the new Azure RM resource group deployment, this is how I look busy at work. I also just realized that this is being recorded, so now my boss knows that this is how I look busy at work. Um, but basically, what, what's really nice about the verbose output in here is it's going to go through and tell you exactly what it's doing and where it's at in the deployment. So it, more importantly than just looking busy at work, it gives you some semblance of where during the, the configuration deployment you're at. Whereas if you're not using the verbose output, you just get a hung console session until it completes and then returns its output data. So I definitely recommend using verbose. So let's go ahead and take a look from a template perspective as to what we're doing here. Okay. So actually, I think that extending my screens is causing some issues, so let me go ahead and just Fix this real quick. Okay, that's better. Can you guys still read that up there? Or do you want me to expand it a bit? Better? Awesome. Okay, so you, you can see here that the input parameters have you know some of the decisions here. So I'm looking for uh, the location. I'm looking for what environment here. Uh, I'm looking for my automation account registry keys and URLs. What my admin user and password are, much like you'll see oftentimes in a lot of these quick start templates. The difference is that because I'm using some level of automation, I can actually obfuscate a lot of this. So maybe I only want to give that user like an input location and what environment level that they have, and then everything else is passed via my automation. So there are a lot of ways to, to obfuscate a lot of that stuff. So you only parameterize what is absolutely necessary. Try to automate as many of those parameter inputs as you can and then give as few choices to the end user as possible because we know end users are humans, humans make mistakes, and mistakes are bad. Um, going through, then we start getting into our variables. Um, I, you know, I have a base application name, and this base application name is actually going to be uh, part of my base naming convention. Then you'll also see here I've gotten in what I call an environment name instance. This is something that I actually kind of add as a standard to all of my templates because when you start getting into the global deployments and you start dealing with like Azure Germany, Azure China, the base URLs uh, are different. So sometimes it's good to have those tables when you're doing those global deployments so you know, hey, you know, this is, this is something that I need to add into my decision making. But you'll also see here that I'm taking like this East US, West US, and North Central US, and I'm you know, basically converting those into smaller character sets that I can actually use into my naming conventions. 
This is really important because I embed that location information into things like my VM where I'm uh, limited to the 15 characters. So, and you can see here the difference between what a regular variable looks like and that uh, complex variable. And the way the complex variable works is I have this thing called environment reference. And you can see that basically what I'm doing is I'm saying, look at this variable table, environment name instance that I have here, and then any table that matches this location input, I want you to grab that as an object. So it's gonna look through and see, okay, I'm deploying to like, for example, East US, and then I have, uh, then automation knows to use that instance name and that region URL base as part of its decision making process. Is that cool? I mean, I can actually embed all of these decisions in, into the code and the user never sees any of this stuff. And I get a little bit crazy here. I start using like base name instance and putting together all of my naming conventions in a single thing. Uh, this is because I'm lazy and I like to forget things. Um, so basically if I can just call out base name instance dot storage, I know it's gonna use that base name. Uh, operating systems, I do it for that. Once again, I'm lazy and like to forget things, so all I have to do is just remember what operating system I'm calling and then put it all together from there. I have Linux in here just to kind of show that you can actually call out different operating systems in the same complex variable set. So if you have a mixed environment where you have some Linux servers doing some stuff and some Windows servers doing some stuff, you can pull from that same table. I'll show you how that works in the, uh, the automation as well. I create my domain name on the fly. So you can see it here. Uh, and then, of course, this is that VM config that I was telling you about. So my non-production servers, I have everything separated out by role. And then when I start building those resource objects, I just dot source whatever property I need. So role server, web server, dot VM size, uh, dot name dot DSC configuration. I don't have to remember it because it's up in here. Where this is also advantageous is oftentimes you're having to use those same values 50 million times in your different uh, resources. Well, now I only have to change it in one spot if I have to update it. So it makes your code a lot easier to update. Just don't do it with the API version. Go for it, Max. So, um, I'm new on this in terms of um, R No. So what this does is it assigns the particular MOF uh, that you already have in your Azure Automation account. So you can see here uh, I've got composite config dot domain controller. Basically what I did was I did a composite config, had all of my role servers in there, and then it generated all these different MOFs called, you know, composite config dot role, and then I just assigned that particular configuration to the box. So, um, and actually, I have a webinar on how to do that. <laughs> Will do. Uh, here you can see the production instance. So basically the same thing. It uses the same kind of reference variable construct. So you can see here I've got a VM config reference to call out that complex variable that I created. And then based off of the environment, it's gonna go and pull that particular table. And then I start dot sourcing those resources later in the configuration. And we're gonna walk through how this works. Here's my DSC local configuration manager stuff. Um, if you had, and, and it, it's a complex variable, yes, but if you had a requirement, say, for maybe you want your, um, so hypercritical servers like your domain controllers and stuff to get monitored as much as possible. You could actually create a complex variable to say for my critical servers, uh, monitor it, you know, run the consistency check every five minutes, blah, 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 and then have a second table for your non-critical servers and have it run however long that you want and then dot source those same things. So the complex variable constructs are critically important to making things impair, uh, in, in item potent. So uh, this is something that I highly, highly uh, encourage that you, you start experimenting with. Um, 
Networks, once again, is a special child. Uh, I find oftentimes that you know, I, I won't put my network stuff into a complex variable set because a lot of the resource objects are actually circularly dependent on a lot of those configuration settings. So when you try to create a complex variable, uh, you run into a lot of circular logic issues. So that's why you'll kind of see those called out as their own things. But you'll also see here too, uh, like for example, I have uh, my VNet uh, subnets called out. You can see I'm calling out that resource ID and then I'm concatenating it with additional string information. And this is something that's particular to network objects. Um, like I said, why they don't just allow you to dot source those particular properties in subsequent objects, not 100% sure. And to be fair, uh, I haven't played with it in some of the newer API versions, so they may allow you to do that. But if you try it and it explodes, this is why, and you know, uh, you'll have examples on how to fix that. I actually have uh, information on OMS instance. So if I want to maybe have different workspaces, I can go ahead and call that out in the same complex variable constructs. Um, and then my load balancer stuff. Uh, I will tell you, is anybody actually built a load balancer with an Azure template? Oh, you're in for a ride. Um, so load balancers are probably the, one of the most finicky ones and do a lot of that weird concatenation stuff with the resource IDs and everything. And this is where it gets circular. Um, so you'll see here that I've got a web server load balance resource ID that I'm calling out. And then I have a load balance probe configuration reference that calls that resource ID. Um, and then I have uh, backend address pools that uh, are called out. And then I have, oh, where is it? Yeah, the, the backend address pools are actually, I think, concatenated later. Uh, in, in the configuration. So, and this is where all that circular stuff came, came about. Uh, um, not yet. I'm actually trying to write a book on authoring Azure Resource Manager templates. The networking stuff is a bit of a challenge. Um, so yeah, it'll get there eventually, hopefully, maybe, we'll see. Um, but this also comes back to another, another point uh, about the whole authoring versus just getting examples. I personally, whenever I create a new object with an Azure template, I have a master template file. And what I do is any new object that I create, I will add it to this master template file. The template file is completely functional in the respect that I could actually deploy it and all of the objects will work. Um, it's going to just be a bunch of random crap that goes into it. Uh, but the reason why I have this master file with every new object that I create is because you might only do it once every so often. Um, but when you do, you don't necessarily want to recreate that wheel. So instead of using the quick start as your reference guide for when you're creating these objects, create your own. Go ahead and build it, learn how it works, figure out what you need or what it needs to, to create that particular resource and then add it into this master reference so that way if you ever need to go back to it, it's the code that you've written which makes it familiar, easier for you to read and easier for you to recognize what you need to do when you're creating a new one. And it's also a lot easier to be able to just scrape that code, paste it in the template and then make the changes necessary as needed. Make sense? Cool. So, oh, did they break the schemas again? They broke the schemas again. All right, this is gonna be fun. Um, so, unless I have it referenced wrong, give me a second. Nope, they broke schemas again, yay. Uh, this will happen on occasion, and I've gone round and round with uh, the Azure team about it. You can see here it's saying the value must conform to exactly one of the associated schemas. 
Occasionally, they'll make an update to the master schema file uh, when they add a new resource and it becomes available. And sometimes for a couple of days, it makes all of your stuff get green squigglies because that reference file isn't quite working properly. Actually, the biggest advantage, and I'm sure this is going to be fixed at some point, is that when you're dot uh, sourcing objects in complex variables, you get linting errors in VS Code. So it's not yet designed to recognize when you dot source stuff. And actually, I think Visual Studio itself doesn't necessarily reference that you're dot sourcing an object property in a complex variable. I think it just doesn't care. So, and I'll show you what the difference is between those two in a minute. Now, you can see here that I've got the API version um, hard-coded per resource because obviously we're not using the uh, um, thing. Oh, actually, that might be why. One moment. Come on, give me my IntelliSense. There we go. Uh, this is the other reason that I, I really like uh, going through is because when you go to set it in the particular resource, um, it will highlight, in, yeah, and it works in VS Code too, it will highlight what API versions are compatible with the particular resource. This goes into how you start modeling your resources. Um, number one, Start with type first. Most of the examples that you see often will show you API version first. The reason why I say type first is because when you call the, the type into the, into the template, then you can uh, call API version, and it gives you the compatible uh, API versions for that resource. If you go the other way around, so I'm going to just go ahead and create a resource here. And we're going to say API version IntelliSense, yes. IntelliSense, yes. There we go. Go. IntelliSense is a little bit slow when you're pulling a foreign schema. Um, it, it's going to pull you a bunch of erroneous APIs. Uh, and actually, when it's fully working, all of those would actually be uh, black and not highlighted because it's basically saying, hey, you're calling a resource but no type. It's compatible with everything. Yay. Um, so you, you want to go with the type first because it'll actually call out the appropriate ones. So you can see in this list where it's like 2014-0401 to 2016-0201. So if I do the storage account type, so type Microsoft dot storage. And I do API version here. you can see I get a different API version list. So always start with the type first because it gives you all the compatible information. Yes? What's the default API version that you like to pull? So right now I'm, I'm getting a little bit of a, a linting issue because I think they updated the schema and it's probably messing with VS Visual Studio right now. But by default, if you call the API version first, it's going to give you a complete list of all of the APIs and all of them will be compatible. Um, now, I'll usually do type first, API version second, location third, but location shouldn't matter because what are we doing? Calling the resource group dot location. And this is what it looks like in code. And this gives me the ability to stamp it out in any region. It's going to go, okay, what resource group am I, am I in? Okay, use that location. We're good. Um, the next thing I do is the, the name. Now, 
basically the, the rules kind of get a little bit fuzzy here. I'll use either the name or I'll use copy index. And I know this is one of the things that somebody wanted to cover, so I'll just go ahead and talk about it real quick. So you have your base naming, and you can see I've got a copy index here. Uh, this is when you start getting into looping and using the same resource for multiple uh, deployments in a single template. So say I need two web servers behind a load balancer, right? I don't want to call those out necessarily, you know, call the same configuration out twice in the, in the same thing. So what I can do is I can use a uh, copy index. The way this works is you need a number. Makes sense, right? You need to know how many loops to do. Uh, I call this out in my VM config reference. So if you go here, you can see instance count, my web servers, I'm saying I want to. Um, but you can see as I go through the go through the template, a lot of the stuff that I'm using, I still use the copy index, um, even if I'm only calling one resource. Because if my developer decides to come back and say, you know what, instead of one box I want two, all I have to do is change the number and redeploy. Um, so you need a number, easy enough. And then you need to be able to uh, create the constructs. So, Naming convention is pretty easy. Yeah, you want to be able to, to make those numerical. Uh, so what I do is uh, I put a zero in front of it and then copy index. And why do I have the one there? Think programmatically. Because by default, when you start programmatically, the first number in an index is So I add that one in there, so my first box is going to be number one. Um, but you also need the copy construct. The copy construct requires two things. It needs to know where to get that number, and this is where you can see how I'm dot sourcing. So there's my, ver my VM config reference, my role server, and the property I want. Pretty cool. Now I just keep stuff in tables and all my decisions are made there, and I don't have anything hard-coded. If I want to change it, I add a new table. I'm good. Um, but the, the copy also needs some type of a loop name. The loop name really only matters to the instance. It's not going to be called anywhere else. Uh, and this is really for the, the record for the deployment. Uh, so you can call it really whatever you want. Just keep it clean, because if anybody decides to audit the logs and sees, you know, VM F word loop, you might get nailed. Huh? The, the name is really just to, uh, because the, the copy loop in itself is its own object, so it just needs a name to reference that. So it really has no um, impact outside of the, the loop itself. Yeah. Uh, you can see here, I've got my tags in here. Um, so I've got like my subscription display name and then parameters for the environment, no big deal. And you can see here that I've got a crap ton of dependencies. So why do I have this? Um, order of operations and requirements. I'm using Azure Diagnostics, which means I need a storage account for my diagnostics. That has to exist before my VM does. I need a network interface. Now, if I look at the network interface for the web server, that has its own uh, dependencies. OK, this is where we get into that linear, logical order of operations. Um, I need to have my availability set exist before my VMs do. Um, and then my configurations. So you can see here, I'm building a domain controller for the environment. I need that domain controller to be up and running before I even deploy this box. So that way, as the domain controller configuration is finishing, then this box starts kicking off, and it's applying its configuration, and that time wait for the Active Directory domain doesn't have to wait very long. So that's where I start referencing all of this stuff. Pardon me? So you do have, uh, actually, 
I can't remember if it's still being managed or not. Um, there is, all right, let me get out of this real quick. Armviz.io used to be a really, really good tool. Uh, basically what it allows you to do is it allows you to load a JSON template and then it can trace back the dependencies. Caveat is the bigger the JSON template gets, the harder it gets for it to be able to track a lot of those dependencies and then it just kind of explodes after a certain point. So, and I, I believe it was actually written by somebody at Microsoft, but I'm pretty sure that the project was eventually abandoned because I haven't seen any updates come out of it in a really long time. It's a good, good starting point to kind of start getting that direction of where your template is going. And then once it gets to that size where ArmViz is already exploding, you've already got a good idea of you know, where you're going with it and how to set your resource dependencies. Because honestly, after the first one, um, a lot of my depends on for my different constructs is going to look really similar. So if I go to like the next VM config, um, you know, I, I have this one where it's waiting on the domain controller, blah, blah, blah. Uh, once again, you know, my dependencies are, I'm waiting for the VM config reference for the domain controller. So, but you'll see, you know, a, a lot of kind of similarities where it's like, okay, these are what the dependencies are, and then you get onto that track. So really creating those first initial resources is where it's a little bit more critical to back check your depends on constructs. After that, everything else is just kind of sauce. Um, so type, API version, name, copy. Okay, is usually kind of the, the construct I set. Tags, optional but highly recommended. Depends on, order of operations. Then you get into your properties, all right? Properties are absolutely 100% dependent, uh, dependent on type and API version, okay? Because what it's going back is, or what it's doing is it's going back and reading the schema. Does anybody know how to actually look up the schema for a resource manager template? Um, so there is a GitHub repo that Microsoft manages that always has the latest up-to-date master schema. Now the master schema calls out all of the, it's basically a library of all the schemas available for the different resources, right? If you want to see what the latest version of perhaps your network one is, or storage one is, or yeah, let's do the storage one because I just updated that. We'll go back here and it's 2017-1001. So we'll go in here, find 2017-1001. And you can see that there's three schemas. You've got one for cache, uh, container registry, network, Power BI, and storage. This is a little bit of an odd duck because you've actually got five different uh, reference types in a single schema update. Typically, if I pick out one, you're gonna only see one schema type in there. So this one's particular to the network. If we open this, um, this is what the schema looks like. And it's just a JSON file. It's got the exact same things, what your input parameters are. Uh, and your input parameters in this instance are gonna be the, those you know, uh, objects that we're uh, referencing. So it's gonna be API version. Uh, it's going to be your uh, name, going to be type, location, tags, blah, 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 blah. Then you can start getting into uh, the requirements here in your properties. So you can see here it's looking for one of these things. So it's going to be either be the application gateway stuff or uh, some type of an expression here, and you can trace it back and read what, what that is. Uh, looks like this is actually a particular to application gateway. Um, application security groups, so these are the, the properties that you would be filling out for that particular object. Wow, okay, I gotta stop moving my head around. 
uh, the, the location inputs, and if we start getting down a little bit further in here, you can see what the required properties are, and then you know by inference what the, the optional properties are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a great place to go back and kind of read through exactly what's necessary. But I rely heavily on IntelliSense to tell me what I need to put in. Um, VS Code does really well with this. Uh, like I said, the, the only real downfall is that when I'm looking in here, you can see all that red on the, on the side. What's it doing red on? It's looking at the dot sourced objects. So I don't like red, so I don't necessarily use um, VS Code for writing this stuff right now. Kind of going back and checking the progress, this is what I was talking about, the object creation. If I go through, you can see here, it's uh, right now it's built my demo domain controller. Uh, looks like it's applying the OMS extension and uh, applying the uh, DSC configuration. So this is why I keep that in verbose and you know, aside from always wanting to look busy. Any questions so far? Go for it. What's that? Uh, for copy index? Uh, yeah, all you have to do is just not call a number. Uh, that's where you start getting into operators. Um, I haven't add, added that part as this part of the talk yet because I haven't had time to experiment it and totally understand it. But yeah, so basically what you're asking is uh, you're looking for like some kind of an if-then reference. So if uh, parameter x says blah do this. So that is now available in Azure templates. Uh, God, somebody just wrote about it recently. I can't remember who it was. Uh, I will tell you that Dan, I Dan, are you in the room? Dan Iverson? So talk to Dan Iverson. I, I know he was asking about it, and I think he's been playing around with it. But yeah, uh, that's not quite in this talk yet. But yes, you can. Uh, any other question? No? Okay. Are we, are you guys getting this? Awesome. Um, do, 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 going a little bit further here. Let's see, so we talked about dot reference. Uh, here's where we start getting into the networking stuff. So, um, are you guys clear on the, the concat versus resource ID? Okay, let me, let me go back and just kind of reference that real quick. So let me grab a VM here. This is really where it becomes most crucially important. Um, so you can see in depends on I'm calling by res, uh, resource ID in, in everything, right? So if I was to call concat in a depends on, when, when we go through and do the initial t uh, template deployment, right? Did you see where I did the, the test deployment command and it said template is valid? What it's doing is it goes and kind of does a pre-compilation of the JSON file to make sure everything's validated. A little bit wishy-washy as far as the, the stuff that it checks. It primarily checks syntax, but it will also check uh, object order of operations it also checks if you're calling concat in dependency as to whether or not the object exists. When you do a new Azure RM resource group de uh, deployment, if you're running in verbose, the first thing you see is template is valid, okay, if it's correctly configured. So it's running that validation check when you do the new deployment. Now here's the thing, if you have concat in a depends on it's going to assume that that object should exist before you do the deployment. If it doesn't, it will fail the template validation. All right? So this is where it gets really important as to where you want to use resource ID versus concat. Resource ID is to call an object that may or may not exist at the instantiation of the template. Concat is essentially looking for a string. 
it doesn't know whether or not that string is going to exist, so it makes the assumption that it should. Um, so basically, it's just going to check the URI that you're putting together and say, does it exist, yes or no? Now, where, where this gets a little bit funky is when you start talking about network constructs. Where's my load balancer? Uh, the network constructs are URI dependent. So you'll see that it's got a reference ID here, and it's concatting the resource ID uh, for the web server load balancer. Now, here's the funny thing. We're in the load balancer object. But it needs the resource ID. But it's looking for the URI of something. So you can see I'm concatting the, the resource ID and then I'm adding that back, ad uh, back end address configuration reference, which if we look at it, is the rest of the string to complete the URI. This is where all the circular crap in the network objects gets really confusing. So I would say if you want to bludgeon yourself mentally but get a really good understanding of how uh, the underpinnings of an Azure resource work, build a load balancer. Um, otherwise, don't do it unless you absolutely have to. Does concat and resource ID make a little bit more sense and how it gets applied and how you need to, okay, awesome. So getting back into here, um, and once again, uh, this is where the dot sourcing becomes exceptionally crucial. Uh, so these are, these are properties that you're going to keep using over and over and over again. Uh, so you can see here I've, I'm using that web server dot name. Uh, here I'm using web server dot name again for part of my base naming for part of the uh, network construct. Um, do, 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 do. DNS address, boring. I start getting a little bit lower into the VM config. You can see here, this is where I'm calling out my operating system information. I don't have to remember what the publisher SKU and version is. Uh, I can just go ahead and call it from that table and then what image am I, am I using. I always want the latest one because I like aggravating my developers. Um, getting a little bit further in, this is where it's taking that credential information that we grabbed from Azure Key Vault and passing it in. It's passing it in as a PS uh, object and then going ahead and parsing out that information. From what I can infer, because I've never gotten a straight answer on this, it looks like it's probably taking the PS credential and then using the, uh, was it get network credential uh, property to, to pass the password in plain text. So it, it's kind of one of those funky things about how it breaks things down, but because we're doing it in automation, uh, it remains obfuscated, especially since we're pulling from the key vault. Um, once again, VM size, because I'm pulling from that table, I can dot source that, and then that pulls from that complex variable construct. Getting a little bit further down into uh, extensions. So you can see here, um, I'm actually, th this is something that's a little bit funky with extensions. So I see a lot of examples online where you can actually create child resources in the VM objects for the extensions. I don't do that primarily because where, if you have a dependency on that extension, uh, coming out with the reference for it is extremely difficult. So what I usually do is I create the extension separately and then have a depends on, dependency for the VM to be created, then go ahead and kick off that extension. So if I have another dependency on that extension, I can call it. Uh, it may have been fixed in later iterations, but my previous experiments have showed that when you have a child extension, it becomes exceptionally difficult to create a dependency on it. So that's why I have it on the outside. Um, but going into it, you can see here, this is where I'm calling in my DSC configuration manager settings. I will tell you that if you have problems with the latest version of the DSC extension, the only way that you're going to get around it is this way. 
the uh, was it Azure RM VMDSC extension commands do not allow you to be able to specify the type handler. So if you want to go to a previous version, you got to do it through a template. I think you can also use the uh, not the DSC extension commandlet, but like the VM extension commands to special, specify type handler version. Uh, but then you have to remember what the uh, type name for the specific uh, thing is, and it's a pain. Uh, here's some of the properties that you'll see in here. So registration URI, that pulls it from our input parameters where we grab the automation account. Uh, VM config reference, this is where I'm getting that configuration name. So all I have to remember is the web server, you know, the role, and tell it to look at the DSC configuration in that table. Uh, configuration mode, so that's going to be, you know, apply and autocorrect, apply only, et cetera, et cetera. Reboot note if needed, uh, that's another thing that I have in the tables. And that's so that way you can actually set these up if you need different configuration settings for different web or server roles. You can go ahead and create that in the table and then it just gets referenced off of it here. Um, also, this is another nice thing, you can specify WMF version in the DSC extension. Uh, I mean, it, some security people might be, no, we're only using PowerShell 5 and not 5.1. Unfortunately, it's against most HR policies to take them out in the backyard and you know, bludgeon them until they start agreeing with you. So you, know, you, you can go ahead and specify those settings in here. That's pretty much where this is at. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I left about half an hour for questions because I know you guys, you know, some of you guys have been expressing some. I was thinking of you in general. So yes, let's go ahead and talk about that. Uh, mode in your resources, you turn that over to Pardon me? I didn't see your mode in any of your resources. Did you turn that over? Uh, by default, I think it's complete. So it's going to go ahead and check through the configuration. And if anything's kind of drifted out of config, it's going to go ahead and kibosh it. Incremental? Um, incremental looks for any of the objects that don't already exist and only creates those. Uh, correct. correct. Okay. Um, now, I will tell you that using the default mode options, one thing that can be affected is custom script extensions. They will re-execute. Re uh, I found that out when somebody had put a sysprep script in without telling me and went and deployed and buy. So yeah, um, the, the custom script extension will re-execute. Any other questions? Here you go. So that's passed as a parameter. Uh, let's go back here. And here. That's the wrong one. Where's the play basic? There we go. So that's set here. The, the de definition of what environment I want. So that's passed in an automation through my uh, parameter object. That is called in here, all right? Then for the VM configuration reference, I have the table built. So I'll just go ahead and fold some of this stuff so we can get NP and PR together. I have my table definitions built on that NP and PR parameter input, okay? And then I have to create those reference objects underneath in the tables like so. So web server, I've got that instance count, VM size, name, DSC configuration, et cetera. Same thing for my domain controller. Now, the way the JSON template puts that together is here. So basically what it's saying is, I want you to look at that VM config table and then that environment input parameter, I want you to grab that object I'm referencing. So I think it was set for NP on my deployment, right? 
So it's going to go ahead and say, OK, anything that matches NP, I want you to grab that table out of this config. So it's going to look in here and go, OK, I need these objects. All right. Now, where it gets applied is basically wherever I need it. But for our example, we were primarily looking at the web server. So if we go here, it's looking at that VM config reference variable that pulled those objects. Then I'm going to say the, the role server object that I created, the web server, I'm going to go ahead and look at that, uh, that object table and then pull the instance count. So then it pulls that reference back and says, OK, here's my web server. There's my instance count. Cool? Awesome. And this is really where we get into all of that decision making. I think about all of these decisions that we've taken out of our users' hands. And we've made those decisions based off, you know, all, all these decisions for them based off of one input. Our computer naming convention, our object, um, uh, our object naming convention, how many objects that we need, how the configuration gets applied. All of these decisions were made off of one input. So now my user is much less likely to, to do something stupid. Any other questions? So primarily, because I, I, yeah, I work as a consultant. So basically, what, what I'm often tasked to do is create the template and then hand it off to their guys for the CI, CD stuff, maybe provide some sample code that they would build for the automation. Um, I myself oftentimes use straight PowerShell for my demonstrations. I've actually been working with a Logic app to try to automate these So because I'm lazy and I like to forget things. So uh, I've been playing around a lot with Logic App where it reads my Google Calendar. So whenever I have a session scheduled, like half an hour before it goes ahead and kicks off a run book to, to deploy it. So there, there's a lot of different ways that you can actually do that. Um, like for example, if you're using, uh, what is it? Not Scorch, what's the, the portal thing that Microsoft has in the System Center? that you can actually have users go to. What's that? Dev Not Dev Test Labs. It's like System Center Service Manager, Service Manager or something. Yeah, uh, it's been a while since I System Centered. Uh, you could actually create a run book off of that where it's like, I want an environment, and then just give them like, what's the, the environment level, and then uh, have your run book actually go out and pull the automation account names and all that stuff for them and then deploy. So there's a million different ways that you could actually build this into your, your run book automation. Any other questions? Uh, because I've actually done it a few times and I have my reference configuration, it, it's gotten a lot faster. I would say the first VM config I ever built was about five days and then coming out and adding the DSC extension to apply a DSC config the first time. It's probably another two days. So uh, it, and this kind of also goes into the design thing too. Number one, work iteratively. Don't be like, oh, you know what, I need a VM and I need a load balancer and I'm going to need these network interfaces and I need the, this VNet and then I need these storage accounts and blah, 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 and execute. You're going to get a lot of red. Um, you know, start simple. Start with the storage account, deploy it, validate it. Start with your, you know, then add your VNet, deploy it, validate. Add your public IPs, deploy, validate. Anytime you add another resource, deploy and validate to make sure that it works appropriately before you add another one. Then start adding in your dependencies. Uh, you're going to save yourself a lot of frustration and banging your head on a table. Pardon me? I do a lot of that stuff with desired state configuration. So DSC's got some great resources uh, for managing like local 
local group policy, local security policy, creating those users. Uh, you know, uh, I'll use oftentimes the automation account credentials for creating like the base user credential, and then I disassemble the credential in my DSC configs to create new ones. So if I have like a series of users that I have to create, but I know that they're all going to have that same starting password, I'll pass that credential in and then break it down by the users and then recompile a new uh, automation credential. So that, that long and short, uh, use desired state configuration and apply those. Mm -hmm. Then I would find a quick start that maybe covered maybe two thirds of what I was trying to get at, but then I would stop running around trying to figure out the last third of the property that I needed and what, what that looked like. So when you're, particularly when you're like diving into something a little bit newer, mm -hmm. um, how do you, what's your resource to go and look for those you know, properties and what they are and what they could be? So, number one, IntelliSense is key. Uh, IntelliSense is going to tell you flat out what you're missing in, you know, in your new object creation. So basically, you're going to get that green, little green squiggly until you have a complete object. Um, and oftentimes, like when I, uh, when I create an object property, so let's go back over to my load balancer because load balancers have 50 million properties. Um, are you? Yes, okay. So if I do this and then I do my little blue quotes, give it a minute because IntelliSense, slow network. It's gonna tell me what additional properties I can actually add to it. And then I can go from there. So use something that does IntelliSense. If somebody's like, I only build my Azure templates in Notepad, well, I too like to get frustrated on occasion, but that's not how I like to do it. Um, yeah. Uh, VS Code, like I said, VS Code works great except for the dot sourcing of object properties. Uh, so it's a good free way to start or get your employer to pay for Visual Studio. Um, you know, in the grand scheme of things with the time it, that you're saving and the standardization that you're providing, it's worth the money. Yeah, somebody's got it. Yeah, somebody got it, so the get Yeah, and, and if your developers are telling you that you're not going to get it without prying it out of their cold, dead hands, well, I can't make recommendations, but they've given you instructions. <laughs> Go for it. Have you Pardon me? Have you no, I haven't. Uh, I keep hearing about it. Uh, it's just, you know, I, I, I go with the tools that I know. There's tons of really awesome tools, so I, I don't, you know, push these kinds of things on them. But like, if Ter Terraform has the ability to read the schema and provide you like actual, you know, usable, relevant information on how to create the the resource, go for it. Anyone else? Go for it. Is it the Palo Alto thing? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. And uh, it requires a public IP address. Yeah. Which is no go. And it wants to create a network security group, which are for a VM deployment optional. Yeah. Uh, but not through their market for their tools or something. So, number one, I have people at my work that sell Palo Alto. So, number one, Palo Alto sucks. Yep. Um, yes, I said that. You can quote me on it, and I'll tell you at work, too. Yes. So, and let's let's talk about this. This is where the the built-in templates in the marketplace are actually really awesome. So, if we go to create a resource, and I type in Palo Alto, um, you know, I'm going to get I don't know, pick one for me. All right. I go here. Uh, I don't know. 
We're going to call you Bob. Put in my super secret password. Create new. Palo Alto. Uh, there, there's, we're, we're getting to purpose on here, so Bob store. Everything's Bob. Oh, somebody already took Bob. Okay, globally unique. Sure, we'll call it that. Yeah, that works. Body, body, blah. So before you buy, uh, there should be a link that comes up for the Azure template. Yeah, here you go. Now, here's here's where the super hypercritical information comes in. Um, I'm not quite sure what this is. Oh, deployments, incremental, blah, blah. Okay, that that looks like just some generic crap. What you need to do is you need to grab the template and kind of scrape the information that you absolutely need. Where it becomes super critical is with like uh, the VM information in particular. So you'll see here uh, image publisher version blah de, blah de, blah. Oh good it's referencing variables. I don't know why they do that. Uh, so if we go to what's it called? Image publisher. Palo Alto Networks actually has their own image. Um, and then here's the SKU and the image offer. You can pull that and then build the additional resources, including the public IP, and attach it to your own network interface. And it should work. Let's pull all references to public IP and IP out of the template. Capture the errors with those information. Including line numbers that don't flow into my parameters or my template. That's weird. Yeah, we, we might actually have to take a look at your template and see. It, I, I would suspect that maybe you have some kind of a depends on going on in there that it's looking for, and then throwing the error. Now, here's, here's something that's a little bit weird uh, with the Azure templates, is that when it throws an error, typically with an error, you're going to get a line and a column. The line and the col column doesn't actually always uh, match where the error is in fact taking place. And I think it's how it compiles, like how the formatting is when it compiles. So sometimes you have to like scroll up 10 or 20 lines to figure out where it's at. But I'm, I'm thinking you probably have some kind of depends on. Yeah. Yeah, but when when it comes to when it comes to third party custom images, they can get, you know, it, it's one of those things where they they can provide support. But it sounds like there's something in your template that is calling it, and I'm, I suspect it's a dependency. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, and this is why I think it's in the template, is that the VM itself is just an image. It's an image reference. So unless there's a specific parameter that it's looking for, which those parameters are going to be called out in there, um, I am inclined to think that it's probably some type of a resource dependency thing that's going on, or they're using some kind of a con concatenated reference that's calling that variable, and you're not seeing it. Um, 
so yeah, I definitely like to take a look at that with you maybe during lunch and we'll we'll hack that out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because typically there's not going to be any type of a return in the VM image that's going to affect the rest of the template. Uh, any other questions? What time is it? You got me for nine more minutes. Anyone? Anyone? No? Oh. Did it survive? It's still building. Um, let's see where we're at. Yeah, this is a really big build because I'm building like a Citrix environment here. Yes. So you want to see like what the configuration looks like? Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see here. I know I have some in here. I'm just trying to think. Yeah, here we go. So, um, no, this. So this is what the composite configuration looks like. Uh, if you're familiar with composite configs, you'll recognize it. But basically, I'm applying a base configuration to all of my systems. Uh, then I have all everything separated out by role. So you can see web servers just basically got domain join. Uh, I actually have it building PowerShell web access because you know I like that as opposed to RDP. Uh, here's my domain controller config um, where I'm actually building out the DC, but I'm also creating uh, my Citrix administrators. Uh, I've got my SQL server here where it's basically just got some nitty gritty stuff for the, the SQL server. Uh, my license server. So basically when this comes out compiled, it builds out um, all of the different roles. And then getting a little bit further into the nitty gritty, you can see here where I've got my uh, Citrix environment and like my director server schema where I'm just basically installing the binaries and all of the additional stuff. So all of this gets loaded up into uh, Azure Automation. Uh, so the uh, composite configs, will be loaded as modules and compiled, and then you upload the uh, primary config that we saw. So this um, will actually get deployed through a script uh, that basically uh, passes some of those configuration settings. Basically what I'm setting here is what's my domain name, uh, what's the automation account that I'm using, and then the admin name. And then in that composite config, you can see here I'm using get automation PS credential to pass that information in. So it's actually going to the automation credential, grabbing that data, and then throwing it in at compile. So and that's, that's essentially what it comes down to. Um, I would love to show you my automation account, except for I have customer configs in there right now. So I don't want to peel that away. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. So, do, 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 do. Uh, I won't be sharing this template. I'm going to just give you guys a basic template. Uh, my boss would probably get a little bit mad if I gave him uh, gave away my uh, Citrix configs. Uh, so first off, um, please do uh, do put in a submit a session rating because you know we we rely on those and. Um, you know, it, even though I'm the incoming CEO, you know, I still am contractually obligated to beat the crap out of myself if I do badly. So, um, yes, please do fill out those uh, surveys. Also, uh, here. So, codes and slides. Um, once again, uh, a gamer living will, all the things, but if you want to go out to GitHub, uh, just look up gamer living will, and I'll have 
uh, by the end of the week, my uh, slides and code up there. Uh, also, cool graphic that I did. Um, well, actually, I didn't do that. I stole it. But uh, also, follow me on Twitter at Gamer Living Well, and then LinkedIn, uh, I, you know, Gamer Living Well, Xbox, PlayStation 4, whatever. Just, yeah, Google that. All right, in that case, get out of my room, we're done. <laughs>